Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Association of Professional Genealogists. You can find out more about them at www.apgen.org. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head to Utah to get to know genealogist Dear Myrtle. Mert, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Great to be here. Let's get started by having you tell us about yourself and give us an overview of your genealogy business. Oh, well, thanks for asking. Uh, the whole concept of Dear Myrtle was really a mistake. I was teaching CPAs how to use Microsoft Excel and transition from paper to Excel, and that was very heady. I, I'm not a CPA, and I had to help them understand that technology. And so I started writing Dear Myrtle as a way to use the other side of my brain, where it was not stressful. Genealogy is a subject that I like. And I always figured I'd uh, use that nom de plume, and no one would never know who old Mert really is. And you've kept that secret really well, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Google kind of forced us into using our real names. And uh, so Pat Richley Erickson, yeah. Nobody knows who that really is. Uh, but when it comes to the blossoming of Dear Myrtle, as people got to read my column, and it was initially on AOL and the genealogy forum, and then when the web was invented for the rest of us, not just scientists, it became a blog, people would invite me to come speak. And it got so that my scheduling in teaching computers in, in my classroom had to be shortened to like three days a week so that I would have time to travel to do speaking engagements on the weekend. So about two, three weekends a month, I was traveling. That was, that was a really busy and very energetic time. So put it into context for us when, if you don't mind uh, mm -hmm. the, mentioning the year that Dear Myrtle first appeared, because I think when you're talking about computers and technology, it's critical that people understand when so that they know how far back in the Internet dark ages we're talking about. Okay, let's take it before the Internet. I was interested and belonged to a genealogy forum called Your Family Tree over in Q-Link for Commodore computer owners. I don't know if you ever knew about those kind of computers. And then that morphed into PC Link and eventually morphed into AOL. So that's the genealogy of that online service. And in those days, Dick Eastman was over on CompuServe, and Meyer Vanderpool Gormley uh, was over on a different network, and none of us could send email to each other because you could only send email to people in your online service. Rhonda McClure was also, she was over on Genie. And so the advent of the internet was kind of interesting because we could then start sending email and communicate with people beyond our online service. So I think that I started actually writing Dear Myrtle sometime in about 1990, the early 90s. I can't actually recall because it evolved. <laughs> and before that, it was 1985 when we started with the online services. So I've been around a long time. And when we went out onto the web in 1995 with a blog and doing HTML, George Morgan of Genealogy Guys came down to my condo and taught me how to code HTML. It was That was the dark ages of the Internet. It was wild, but it was a way to get the word out about how to do genealogy, about methodology, about record groups. And that's what all these online services, message boards, uh, <laughs> mailing lists, some of the mailing lists still subsist to this day. So kind of interesting to watch how it's evolved. 
So for those of you in our audience who are newer to genealogy, uh, I, I'm going to point out what is, is pretty obvious, hopefully, at this point. And, and that is, in talking to Dear Mer, we're really talking to somebody who's a pioneer in the field of genealogy, particularly in the field of using technology and using the Internet to bring technology along. And w we're going to dive into this a bit today, I think it's it's really critical because you're still bringing cutting edge technology to genealogists even today. But I think a lot of people don't realize just how deep your experience is uh, and how far back you go. So that I mean, we we started off really well, and and it just blows my mind to think of these these online <laughs> services before the internet. I was I was on the internet when it first started. I was coding HTML in, in 1998. Mm -hmm. I, I met this guy online in New Jersey, and he taught me how to code online. And uh, <laughs> we're still friends today on Facebook, no less. So uh, it's it's really just astonishing how everything has transferred. Evolved. Yeah, evolved. Yes. Um, but I want to talk about you specifically mm -hmm. because in addition to becoming Dear Myrtle, I mean, you've been an author. You've been a computer instructor. What I didn't know before today was that you were a radio show host. You had a podcast. So I really want to hear about that. Mm -hmm. And I want to dive into your public speaking training, all this kind of stuff. Let's start with the podcast. I'm just dying to hear about that. <laughs> In the olden days of podcasting, they were they could be live streamed but archived as a podcast. And Brett Lang, who's one of the I think it's 13 men that have the patent for TCP/IP protocol which is what one computer uh, sends information to another computer. That's basically the backbone of the Internet. For fun and games, he took an interest in Internet radio streaming and my project in particular. How we ever met up, I do not know. <laughs> it was a miracle. I think techies kind of pull together. And in those days, I can remember hooking up a little Radio Shack gizmo to a telephone so that I could tape record an interview with Elizabeth Schoen Mills. And she is such a consummate professional that when she, her son had had some health issues, very serious health issues, and she just found out about them, I said to her, I know we have this appointment Let's not do it so that you can go forth and, and tend to what you need to. And she said, no, I'll keep my appointment with you. <laughs> and so it was incredible. Our quality, our sound quality was horrible. But that was only an issue of technology at that point hadn't progressed. If you think of the old 78 RPM records, they're very scratchy. The old Caruso it isn't just scratchy because it had been played so many times. It just wasn't good sound quality compared to what we can record digitally now with a little handheld digital recorder or our iPhones or, or our tablet. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting how that's all progressed. Yeah. And as you know, it's not easy to do podcasting. There's a lot of, a lot of editing to do. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I, I want to mention that since you brought that up. For people who are learning about blogging, which is usually the first entry into broadcasting out to a wider audience, um, mm -hmm. one of the first things they're told is, you know, you need to come up with a schedule and you need to commit because the, the, the hardest thing for people is that they start a blog because it's free and then, you know, three mm -hmm. months down the road, it's done. <laughs> they don't blog again. Mm -hmm. And multiply that by 10 times and you'll get the amount of work that it takes with podcasting. And I think... You can more quietly disappear in a blog. You can fade with a blog a little more quietly than you can with a podcast because mm -hmm. uh, people f might follow you more regularly and, and they say, hey, where'd you go? So it's a really, really big commitment and it's a lot of work. But I would encourage anyone who's interested to try it because um, well, it's, it's a great way to connect. Well, and we could probably mention that the equipment you're using is Skype, and you're using an add-on program, I'm assuming, to record this interview, and it's very high-quality sound when you're done. Yeah, I don't actually use software to record my interviews mm -hmm. because computers, God love them, sometimes the files get corrupted. So I actually record through a mixer, mixer out to an audio recorder. To ensure oh. that I, I I might do a a software backup, but I yes. don't um, I don't record directly to software for that reason. Yeah. So you're actually using 
a mixing board like we had in our radio station. Exactly. Yeah, I've got the I, little slider bars and all that. Yeah, I've got. I, I guess you would call it prosumer equipment. I'm not um, at the level of a radio station because you know I don't have twenty thousand dollars. But uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've got some very good equipment that I uh, record on, and yeah. Anyways, well, <laughs> speaking to people um, and getting the point across to them through their hearing is a very effective way. If people could get the concept of how to do family history research or, you know, compose a good proof argument, et cetera, if they could get it from a book, we would never have a need for podcasts, blogs, hangouts on air, webinars, and all of these are, are very popular uh, tools and they're just other doorways for people to access the content that we provide. I would congratulate you on the quality of your podcast. Pretty good stuff you do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, one of the things I love about podcasting, and not to turn this into an interview about podcasting, but is, is that you can really maximize your downtime. So I mostly listen to podcasts. I didn't used to listen to podcasts. I used to create podcasts, but I didn't actually listen to them. And now mm -hmm. I do. And now I'm a podcast junkie because there's such fantastic <laughs> content out there. But what I love most is that you can be in your car driving or you can be mm -hmm. walking or exercising and you don't have to stop and look at a computer screen or, or something like that. So you're now turning dead time into really valuable learning time. And that's what I love about it. I totally love that. And when it comes to like webinars, I will jokingly tell people when I still do public speaking on occasion that I listen to podcasts, I listen to webinars, other hangouts on air, whether it's about genealogy or any subject. The theory is that I'll get some filing done, but invariably I get wrapped up in the presenter and the concepts that they're trying to, that person is trying to have me grasp. And if it's a webinar, I can look at the document that they're analyzing, for instance. So I end up sitting here in my chair after all. Yeah. <laughs> but it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Now, just to circle back to to your podcast, I just want to mention from my notes here, you actually started as a weekly call-in talk radio show on an AM station mm -hmm. and in 2000. And this was called The Seeker and Dear Myrtle. Mm -hmm. Was there wow. another person doing it with you? Uh, yes, there was another person. She worked mostly with people who were adopted. And she liked to work with me because I took the concept of family history and doing genealogy research that way through record groups and through evidence that might be found in different documents mentioning our ancestors or inferring them. So it was a good mix because people who have adoption issues, I mean, they could still work on their adopted family line, but it's a very tender subject to deal with, especially in those early days before states were prepared to have adoption intermediaries and things along that line. Man, you did a lot of digging to find out about me, kiddo. I, I haven't thought about that show. We did that for two years, and, and then I moved on to a different uh, radio station where we recorded the podcast. So very interesting work. You've done your homework, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to be thorough. And the burning question, the burning, burning question I have for you is what happened to your early podcast, now that you've mentioned Elizabeth Shone Mills, do you, do you still have this recording somewhere? Yes, I have them. I keep moving them over to the next computer, so they're now in my Dropbox folder. Um, I do have those early interviews, and I haven't listened to them for years, but I think that that keeping up with technology and moving it to the next computer so the hard drive's viable and then now using the cloud, I think that's the same charge we have as genealogists to take what information we have found and keep up with technology as it marches along so that we can hand it off to our descendants at the most recent technology level. Kind of an interesting parallel there, wouldn't you say? And I think you're particularly lucky because I imagine your children are all indoctrinated and <laughs> <laughs> have, yes. have already had the Kool-Aid so they know that they're going to do this. Whereas for the rest of us, it's going to be more of a challenge to make sure it actually happens when they get these files in whatever format. It takes. It'll happen. It will. I was shocked when Carrie called me up one day and said, Mom, 
I'm in, and I thought she meant she was home for the evening. And she said, and I said, great, that's wonderful. And she said, but do you think it'll be a problem if we end up going to the same genealogy conferences? And I started to get excited. And <laughs> she wants to do genealogy. And her take on it is completely different from mine. She can do the research. She's working on her father's line, which I don't work too often. And she'll come back to me and say, I've looked at these documents. There's this problem with this one, but I think this is the resolution of that problem. And and I'm like, yay. But her main thing is getting a, a page in a scrapbook, a digital scrapbook, with the photo, with the story on the side. She's more story-oriented, which I think is the way to get these younger folks into family history research. Yeah. They're curious. I love that. And and I, I wish more people would actually focus on that, bringing these stories to life, because I think you're right. I think that is absolutely the way to get family history into the mainstream, to get more yeah. people interested in it rather than just names and dates and mm-hmm. the, the the search. So I'm, I'm with you on that. But it's a really nice combination that the two of you have different focuses. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a business podcast, so I want to focus just for a moment on this transition you made because you've already told us you were a computer trainer. Tell us about that transition that you made because you already – hinted at that public speaking on the weekends was starting to take more and more time. At what point did you say, I'm going to walk away from the computer career and I'm going to just go into this genealogy thing full time? And and how did it evolve for you? Well, it actually um, happened because of my parents' um, hospice situation. So I was continuing to have a hectic life before Um, our parents were put on hospice. And I was just to the point where if I'm traveling for sure about three weekends a month, and then and I'm good at selling pamphlets and things like that at that seminar where I have additional income. I was just at the point where I was ready to say, okay, I don't need to keep teaching in that computer lab anymore. But what happened was I'm the oldest child. We'd agreed that since my children were grown that I'd take the last run with my parents. That proved to be very interesting because I was the oldest and could remember all the old places we went. And so from a from a genealogist's point of view, you're not just going to sit around with your parents in their wheelchairs. They wanted me to take them up to Queen Anne Hill to see where dad's home was when he was a young boy. And I could sing the old songs and that really reinforced that. At about two or three weeks into this process, it meant I had moved from Florida to uh, Medina, Washington. I realized I could not keep blogging at the rate I was blogging, which was two blog posts or so a day. There's so much happening in the world of genealogy. I knew that I needed to focus on these parents. And they gave me, of course, full reign of the house, and I found all kinds of genealogical treasures in the genealogy drawer. Photos that I hadn't seen before of my grandmother Myrtle. That's how I got my gnome de plume. (laughs) I picked her name because it was old-fashioned and ever so dear to me. I had a struggle right there because family comes first, no matter what. But the struggle was I love doing this genealogy. I managed to farm out all of my speaking engagements. I I was careful, very careful, before I contacted each one of those speaking engagement contract uh, points to look for a suitable replacement and to give that program chair two or three options. So that transitioned and meant that I uh, I met my obligations, although I wasn't ultimately the public speaker. About six weeks after that, I thought, how am I ever going to catch up? I mean, Dick Eastman's continuing to write and Cindy's continuing to do her thing. You know, it was and, – and something inside during a walk, I was actually listening to 
one of my old podcasts on my iPod and I turned it off and the tears came, which I think happens when you're in a time like that with your parents. And I realized you focus on the parents now and when their time, when they've passed, you'll be able to pick it up. Just don't worry about it. And thank heavens that's the way it worked out. Um, Within the year my mother passed away and nine months after that my father passed away and those were treasured moments. I have more stories to sit out in the garden weeding with my nine-year-old grandson because of the time I spent with my parents. So there was a a life-altering intervention in my business that caused my business to just stop. Then I had to, it was not a problem to rebuild it. I think it's it's really important because I, I think, particularly for genealogy professionals, these kind of things happen and genealogy professionals aren't always equipped to understand what exactly should they do in, in a situation like this. I think most would, you know, put the importance on their family, but the, the pressure is definitely there and there can be financial pressure there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it's it's good to see how people are handling this situation. But, you know, once your parents had passed and you had more time to focus in this new direction, what what were your first steps? What did you do? And, and you By know? the time my parents had passed away, Facebook, social media had taken off. I can remember when I first was looking at Facebook, my parents lived in Medina, Washington, So it's very close to Redmond. I mean, you know, that's Microsoft's headquarters. Bill Gates was up around the corner and bought gas at the same gas station. And I saw this sign that said Facebook, and it was right there. I'd pass it every time I'd go to pick up my parents' prescriptions. And I thought, what the heck is Facebook? It looks like it's something online because of, I don't know, some, some little logo or something. So I logged in. And I can remember I was on the phone with Bruce Busby and I said, Bruce, you know, he's, he's Roots Magic. Would you please sign up for Facebook so I can have a friend? Well, <laughs> by the time my parents had passed away, Facebook was starting to take off. And there were um, there was a genealogy group. I set up the Dear Myrtle Facebook page. And I started getting back into things that way. Google had emerged and we used a Google Reader so that I could... I needed to get up to speed with what was trending in the world of genealogy. They call that now trending. (laughs) But at the time, it was like, what's happening? What are people thinking? Where are the conferences? What are the topics? What are people doing? And I found that my focus as Dear Myrtle was still viable, but I used it in a different way. My focus as Dear Myrtle was for beginning genealogists. I want to either speak publicly or do one-on-one consulting with a client, not to do their research, but to teach them how to do their own research, to encourage them to seek out record groups for that particular locale where an ancestor once lived, but also then to step back and do the analysis, teaching the genealogical proof standards so that folks, and it isn't me being superior. It's more like rolling up your sleeves and working with someone. It's getting out from behind the podium and talking to people about their real research challenges and tying that back into these basic guidelines in the genealogical proof standard. And I tr- I found that my own health as I was aging became an issue. I was doing a lot of public speaking, but it was harder for me. I don't know what happened in two years or three years, but I will admit that our parents had invested wisely and that we're beneficiaries, the six of us, of their wise investments in several businesses. So I didn't have a financial challenge. I could let my creativity see what's happening and what tools are there available so I could transition into doing more teaching, more interacting with other genealogists using technology like webinars, hangouts on air. When I did webinars, people thought I was nuts. <laughs> and now that's... What, why, that's did, <laughs> why did they think you were nuts? 
Why should we go to an online class where we can, I mean, I don't know why they felt oh, that Oh, oh so you were just ahead of your time. You were, you were doing webinars at the beginning. Yes, and then Jeff got into it. And in those early days, Jeff Rasmussen and Bruce Busby and I would collaborate, although we weren't necessarily on each other's webinars, although I have been on 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 Jeff's, we collaborated with how is the technology working or not working? You know, as they come up with version two of go to webinar um, or the recent upgrade, is it worth upgrading? It's a free upgrade, but sometimes it would be problematic. And so there was collaboration like that. And that was invigorating. There wasn't competition. It was, it's collaborating. Those are the kinds of relationships I seek with professionals uh, so that we can each grow in our own sphere. But I see it as a way to learn the technology and then do a better job of presenting or I'm, I call myself the opinionated moderator on Mondays with Mert on my hangout on air where I really want to know what people on the panel are thinking about, what their concerns are, where their challenges are with technology or with research. It isn't so much, Marion, that I know the answer. It's that if we have a webinar or hang out on air where it's like a panel discussion, yes, there's some topics you plan to discuss. But that kind of opportunity to speak openly doesn't come up at your typical genealogy society meeting where there's a lecture, probably a business meeting that goes on too long before that, then the lecture, 15 minutes of Q&A, and then you go home. You need to have a chance to talk one with each other, and we each try to describe the problem. And if you turn the light bulb on for the person, as opposed to me, I don't care. It happens that the light bulb goes on, and that's pretty powerful. There's two points that I just want to talk about based on this. The first is beginners. Your focus has always been on beginners, and you've been at this for quite a while now. Do you have any sense from looking across your whole genealogy career, how do these beginners find you? I think it's like the old Breck shampoo commercial. They tell two people and they tell two people. And the word spreads. People find me because I do have a website. That's obviously where you found that old bio where it mentions QLink and, and some of my early work. I have a blog, and I'm actually blogging less. I'm doing more video blogging now. The podcasts are archived over on the Internet Archive. Any one of these doorways, I am on LinkedIn, but I don't use it very much the people that I work with are beginning genealogists. They just stumble across me. I don't know why. I don't know how the heck they find me, Marion. I know that by having a presence on Facebook as a Dear Myrtle group that people can join. Same thing over on on Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus is interesting because you can uh, follow people just like you can on Twitter. And we could put them in circles but the best thing are the communities because it's like a bulletin board. But you can also go there and see the most recent uh, hangouts on air archived or as they occur live, post questions, and Cousin Russ brings them into the mix. So people tend to hear about it at a conference. I, I yeah. met a lot of new people uh, just recently at NGS. I didn't have a booth. I had my ambush cam. Did you hear about that? Not only did I hear about it, but I, I watched it. <laughs> yes, I, the concept of that, now that we have technology where you can create a live YouTube stream using your smartphone and, and a really good microphone, hooked up to it. It's kind of interesting, all that technology. And just do short two-minute or three-minute interviews. And it doesn't really stress the person you're interviewing. You're not taking them away from lunch or the next uh, meeting. Or if it's a vendor, you're really not taking them away from their the visitors that might come to their booth. In fact, it makes their booth look interesting because somebody's there with this weird equipment on a tripod. And they're curious to find out 
what it is. And a couple of people are like, I could do this at the family reunion. And I'm like, yes, you can. And then people who can't come to the family reunion can actually watch it live if you have a community where it's easy for them to see these events taking place. They could also watch it on the YouTube side, but I digress. So, well, let's dive into this a little bit. This, So you're really all over Google Plus and Hangouts on Air. This is your latest thing. You moved from webinars to Google Plus and mm-hmm. Hangouts on Air. And, you know, one of the things I like, well, let me just first say, you know, people think nothing's happening on Google Plus. And I hear that from a lot of people. And I'm like, you're so wrong. You have no idea. You have to get over to Google Plus. There are many, many, many genealogists on Google Plus now, and there are tons of podcasters on Google Plus as well. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. There's a lot happening on Google Plus. One of the things that is so great about Google Plus is that it's so tightly integrated between the Hangouts on Air and YouTube and Google Search that it's just a really effective, easy tool to use. And I'm, I don't even know like the stuff that you know, because I haven't tried Hangouts on Air. But it, it, it's really neat the way you can do this for free. You've got your Mondays with Mert every Monday at noontime and that it's noontime Eastern, right? Yes. But I've learned to say Eastern and then in parentheses, New York. You know why? People, we have to start thinking globally. People over in England and Wales or over in Australia, they're on completely different time zones. And the time zone converter websites need you to plug in New York and then whatever that person's um, a city is. Um, and so I, tend, I have to think of the global impact. And routinely uh, on our Hangouts on Air, we have people from Ireland and Wales and Scotland. And recently, Germany has opened it up so that, you know, we always think of China as closing off internet access to their residents. But Germany had a law that prevented YouTube being viewed. And since Hangouts on Air are archived on YouTube and so well integrated, I had people writing to me saying, I can't view your Hangout. I can't view the archived version. I can't view the live version. And uh, all I could say was, it's your government that's not permitting it. That has since been resolved. So it's pretty cool how we think globally with, with Hangouts. Back to you again with where we are. I'm, I see I am all over the map. That's today. okay. That's okay. So, and I agree with you, New York time is much better. Uh, I sometimes get mixed up doing these interviews, talking to people <laughs> around the world. And yeah, I I was late actually to an interview recording with, with somebody I absolutely shouldn't have been late with. And I was so embarrassed because I got the time zone thing all wrong, but oh well. All right. So for any of you who haven't really explored Google Plus, I would I would head over to Dear Myrtle on Google+. Plus. Check out the community. Check out her. Actually, I watched a video of yours mm-hmm. uh, recently. It had nothing to do with this interview. I wasn't doing background research. I was just mm-hmm. watching YouTube videos. And you had this little video, 15-minute video, on how to change a Google+. Plus profile. But I loved it because you had this graphic right at the beginning that broke down the different components of Google+. Plus. So you have mm-hmm. the Google Plus profile and then the Google Plus community and Google mm-hmm. Plus pages, like business pages. And, mm-hmm. and you were just talking about how to change your profile on that one. But that one slide for me was like, wow, that is so clear. So anyways, what I would suggest to people is head over to find Dear Myrtle on Google Plus, And then you will see exactly how it works because she is using it to the maximum, to the fullest. And, and then also, you know, check out the Mondays with Mert, which are the Google Hangouts on air. And if you can't do it live, just go to the YouTube channel for Dear Myrtle, which is tightly integrated, and you can watch it there. And, you know, even just watch one and just really get a sense. You will, you will be amazed at how many people are contributing because you have the, the nine other panelists. If there are, You can have up to 10, right? Yes. And Cousin Russ, Russ Worthing, he's my real cousin, his main focus is to look in the community for comments, and he weaves them into our conversation. So it's not just the panelists. Right. It's, we are finding we're getting in the high 90s 
during, as far as engagement figures, of the people that are watching it live, and they can now test this out, there's ways to analyze all this stuff. Of the people watching, 90% of them are are typing questions, commenting, and then Cousin Russ brings that in. That's a pretty high number as opposed to people who are doing their filing during right, menus right. with Merck. So, so not only do you have the panelists who we can actually view on video, yes. but there's also the integration with the people who aren't panelists but are watching the live streaming and they can leave comments and people mm-hmm. can see these comments. So there's a, a real high level of interaction and community and and that was, from what I understand, part of the reason why you switched from webinars to Hangouts on Air, because of this sense of interaction and community for everyone. Yes. It's really important that we work together to solve our genealogy roadblocks. I don't even like to say brick walls anymore, because they really are tumbling down. And this sense of community and of belonging, it's an online genealogy society, when you think about it. And and. Then something else has happened. Two other things I do in the week besides Mondays with Mert and the short subjects. I've started doing Wacky Wednesday, which is in the evening. And the purpose of that short one hour, it's hard for me to talk in only an hour. I'm into 90-minute presentations, is to be totally wacky, dress up as Fräulein Schmidt, and use a weird accent, but teach somebody how to use something like Dropbox or blogger.com. And what it does is it takes the pressure off. It doesn't marginalize. It doesn't degrade the quality of the presentation. It takes the pressure off of needing to be perfect. And and then we have our genealogy game night now on Saturday evenings. And I've had people who have wanted to come to Mondays with Mert and were afraid to be in the community and watch it because they weren't sure of the technology. And they've literally said to me, oh, good, I'll come to game night because that should be easier. And do you realize it takes a lot of different outreach programs to pull people in so that they can have the opportunity to converse with people and and solve these genealogy problems. It's it's so much fun. Now you got to have fun. Are these all hangouts on air? Everything I do now, I very seldom blog. Yes, they're all hangouts on air, which means they're recorded automatically. I don't do any post production. I do a lot of work pre in advance, planning topics to discuss. So there won't be dead space, like on Mondays with Mert. And sometimes we actually get to most of the topics on my list. (laughs) But typically what I do is be in the green room before I press the record button. I'll ask the panelists or I'll have noticed people posting things in the community in advance and of the hangout of Mondays with Mert and they will uh, whatever those concerns are we weave them in and and get those concerns addressed and it's pretty exciting we've even had Huguenot research where it came up during a hangout on air somebody two days later was at the family history library and looked up that ancestor and gave the information, you know, scanned it and sent it to the person. We had a similar one with Hessian soldiers. Heather Rojo was part of that scenario. Again, research was done by other members of the community who had access to certain record groups to help that person uh, along their path. So it was pretty cool. You had mentioned that you were doing webinars and people were like, you know, what is she doing? Clearly, you've been at the forefront of technology with everything you're doing. You're still doing that because you're one of the few people doing Hangouts on air. Mm -hmm. Given your background and all the change that you've seen, how do you think that genealogy education should change? What are we still missing because the discussion is, is kind of, I hate to say this, but the discussion is happening in your Hangouts. When we go to conferences and stuff, we watch the talks, we go to workshops. Sometimes we do some networking, but it all seems so hurried. And you always wish that you had more time. And there isn't time for the kind of discussions that you're having with your community 
Is there a compromise somewhere or do we need all these different types or do we just need more of the type of community oriented, you know, integrated Google Plus sort of educational opportunities? Where should we go with this? Every one of the options you mentioned are good options. One additional one would be an institute like down at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama this week, where you spend a week in a university setting going to intensive classes every day and homework every night where you're really focused on Irish research or honing your writing skills, etc. I think that Some people relate to the lecture format. I don't happen to, but that's okay uh, if that's what works for that person. I doodle. I don't take notes. You know, each person has their own way. But I honestly think this is going to happen. For me, the... The, my income in the world of genealogy is where I do a private hangout on air and I appear virtually to a distant society like Western Massachusetts Genealogical. It saves that organization from paying my travel expense, putting me up in a hotel, etc. And it saves me the wear and tear of lost luggage and being away from my research, and also the fact that I'm getting older. I think we can say that. I have white hair now. (laughs) You know, when I started, I was a gorgeous brunette. But (laughs) anyway, I think that more virtual presentations for a fee, I get paid a speaker's fee, and I think that speakers need to receive an honorarium for their efforts. As you know, when you present, it takes hours of preparation to come up with your one hour or 90 minute presentation. I do agree with Dr. Jones, who for years in in teaching at Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy, asked for 90 minute class sessions rather than one hour class sessions, just so that more of this conversation back and forth can happen in it. And he's morphed from being totally lecture more into this uh, maybe two-thirds lecture and one-third, which is a lot more than 15 minutes at the end of an hour, more uh, conversation back and forth. And, and it's, I think it is when we are in an environment, a tone set by that presenter, where a person is not afraid to ask a question, that real learning can happen. There has to be some instructor-led content, but... For the people in that room to relate to it, there has to be this type of conversation going on. Before we leave the topic of education, tell us about the study groups that you're involved with. Well, when Dr. Jones came out with Mastering Genealogical Proof, it was a, this is a breakthrough in understanding research methodology and how to specifically apply the genealogical proof standard. So using the public, not private, but the public hangouts on air, um, I set up a study group with 15 panelists, although only 10 could be on at a time. That allowed for people traveling, etc. And what we do is we take one chapter at a time. I've had two series of 10 sessions, and you may note there are not 10 Uh, chapters. Uh, There are, I think it's nine. Each study group at one point or another got stuck. And we agreed then at that point to take an extra week on that chapter so that we could get over that hump. What it's done for me is I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot about where my holes are in my research methodologies by our discussing the words that Dr. Jones has put on paper in these in this book, it's also available digitally, it helps any of us that are participating in this study group to understand what in the heck is he saying? You know, what is the difference between a proof summary and a proof argument? How do I pull my reader through my thought process in a proof argument to come to the same conclusion. And it helps when you have many voices to get the point across. Fortunately, these the first study group was all U.S. researchers. Let me just give you background there. And the second one, which we concluded this uh, spring, 
was half U.S. and half British uh, researchers. Interesting difference. But fortunately, there was a great deal of candor. They were very gracious participants and spoke to the areas where they had trouble understanding a certain concept so that we could help each other through that discussion. So it was interesting. They're both recorded uh, series and they're available on my YouTube channel. And we intend to do another one starting in the fall. And how would somebody find out about that? Do they go to the Deer, the Deer Myrtle community or to your Google Plus page? They'll find it there and also in my blog because that's something I do put in my blog and schedule. This is what we plan to discuss each week. And then uh, as we have discussed it, I will put the link for that uh, most recent chapter discussion. We also have the advantage of looking at the chapter discussions from the previous study groups. There is another study group going on, uh, not unlike the ProGen study groups, where they're not recorded and they're in a quieter setting. I use that term. You couldn't stumble across it. They're not recorded. And some people like the smaller group where it's not recorded. Others like this, you know, there's different strokes for different folks kind of thing. Is that other one through Angela Packer-McGee? Yes, Okay. Exactly. Just to bring full circle, you know, what a pioneer you are in genealogy and in technology, we have to mention that you're the founder of the Genia Webinars calendar. So I can't leave the whole webinar thing going back to, you know, people people shaking their heads at you. So you actually made it easier for everyone by creating GeniaWebinars.com. And anyone can go to that today and see what's upcoming with webinars. Because there are many webinar providers now. Some are free, some are not. But you can see it all right there. Yes, and I had to change the tagline to include any kind of online genealogy discussion because you'll see Jen Baldwin's Gen Chat uh, there with the hashtag Gen Chat. You'll see uh, Southern California's things. There's about 200 hours worth of genealogy education, whether it's paid or free. In fact, Each one of the hosts of these various programs, National Archives out of Georgia, they've got one. Uh, Many, several state societies hold webinars. Krista Cowan's doing the live chat. That's the software they use rather than go to webinar. And instead of me keeping the calendar on my own, I mean, because I would be doing that full time, each one of the hosts has been given access to that Genia Webinars Google Calendar so they can add their own events, modify and make a last-minute change if it gets canceled or something. And they have access to the GeniaWebinars.com blog. And it it works great. Only occasionally do I have to go in because somebody deleted everything (laughs) and I have to restore it. It's a little fluke, but it's very easy for people to find out about what's happening in the way of online education. And just to make the distinction, this is for live events, right? Because of yes. podcasts, things like that, that are recorded, those are not included in the calendar. So it's just really for uh, live streaming events, live webinars, and live mm. gen chats, right? Yes, where there's more interaction. I have one more question here, and then we have to head to the lightning round. Oh, um, yeah. What is, looking across the your career and all the things that you've done, what is the most fun project that you've ever worked on that you can share with us? Oh, wow. The most fun project I ever did was with the man who founded Oshkosh Trailers. And he wanted to do a family history video. And this was when it was really video tapes. And he had looked into various services and he knew me to be a computer consultant. I did consultant on the side when I was um, a teaching at the corporate level, the use of computers, uh, before my genealogy weekends got so busy. Anyway, he approached me because I had already tutored him a couple of sessions on his computer. And I said, you know, $7,000? Let's buy a little video camera, lay these pictures out on your dining room table, and as you pick up each one, and talk about your ancestors, we'll get that on tape. And so that was my most fun project because for, I think we probably had about six sessions. 
He just paid me my normal uh, tutoring rate, and that I was happy to do it. But what happened was his family history, his recollections of his parents, of his grandparents, of his children when they were young, came alive. He had these pictures to share, a couple of documents like his father's World War I uh, discharge papers, things like that. And it was he was telling the story in his own words. And it was marvelous. I gave him several copies of it on VHS tape. And then later, when DVDs came out, that's a long time ago. I have had good projects since then. But anyway, that was the most fun because it was the first time I helped a person tell their family story. And to watch it on tape, it was just, it was fascinating. And he was excited. And his wife, who's normally very quiet, would sometimes chime in. So to get that interaction was cool. Wonderful. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from the Association of Professional Genealogists. My name is Harold Henderson. I've been an APG member since 2007 and I serve on its board. You don't have to already be a professional to join APG. It's a great place to go when you are beginning to take genealogy more seriously and want to find others who do. There are plenty of chances to learn and ways to volunteer. My favorite is the members only mailing list for sharing information and asking for help. Learn more about APG at www.apgen.org. All right, Mert, we are now going to enter the lightning round. We are going to pick up the pace, okay. speed up the tempo, and okay. hit you with a bunch of questions. Okay. All right. Uh, what was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting your genealogy business? Uh, that I would stumble with my words and make a mistake. What is the best advice you've ever received from someone else? I had a friend who said... It's not about you. Uh, It's about your audience. Mm. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? Take up hang gliding. Would you like to explain that a little further? (laughs) Okay. It's not a book. It's uh, to get out of reading, to get out of genealogy. It's to do something completely different. Go for a walk, uh, go to the beach, uh, do something and use the other side of your brain. Don't even think about genealogy or worry about your career. And it's pretty amazing because you come, I'm not actually going to take up hang gliding, Marion, but you come back refreshed. And I like to say it's a pretty amazing what our subconscious can do to solve some of these genealogy business challenges, our definition, our branding, who we are in this space. So, you know, we just kind of need to get out of worrying and playing for a little bit. It's kind of fun. You know, I agree with this 100 percent, you know. Uh, sometimes when I'm giving webinars or whatever, I tell people to go take a walk. And I really, really believe in this. You have to interrupt what you're doing and you put yourself and your brain in a different environment and shake it up. And, and that's when all your answers will come and everything will happen in your creativity. It's, it's just a brilliant suggestion. <laughs> Do you have a productivity tool or an app that you love that you can share with our audience? Yes, I use a little app on my iPhone called Cozy, and it's C-O-Z-I, and it can import a Google Calendar. It has about four Google Calendars on it. You can share it with other members of your household, so Mr. Mert and I have that, and if he'll add something to the calendar, I receive notice of it. So we're no longer making appointments and stepping on each other's toes. And it will give you little pop-up reminders. You can set them for minutes or hours. I set one for an hour before this interview and one for 15 minutes before this interview. So I wouldn't forget. I'm getting old, you know, Marion. <laughs> well, I, I love those little reminders, too. Yes. Uh, what is your preferred social media channel? I can't wait to hear this. It's definitely Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus does not filter my uh, notices. I'm in charge of if I receive notices in my mainstream or if I have to go to the quilting group to look at what's in that community. Facebook isn't that way. Less than 6% of my 
2,000 plus followers ever hear about a post I've made over in Dear Myrtle, and that's very frustrating. I'm not paying seven bucks every time I post so that uh, it'll have a, a broader reach over on Facebook. So it's definitely Google+. Plus. Well, and let's also add that on Google+, Plus, all of your posts and everything are searchable, whereas mm -hmm. everybody knows from trying to find something from last week on Facebook that you can't. Oh. So that's yes. the, the coolest thing on Google+, Plus is that you could write something. Six months from now, somebody can find it just from totally. searching. Yeah. Absolutely. It's awesome. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Does it have to be a book? Well, no, it doesn't actually have to be a book book tell it give it hit a hiss with what you got <laughs> okay definitely seth godin's blog he is the go-to entrepreneur in the world of blogging and though he doesn't speak about genealogy even the titles of his blog posts will get you thinking and get you outside of your little conundrum i also think that anything elizabeth shown mills writes is advisable evidenceexplained.com see notice i'm doing mostly online things but of course mastering genealogical proof by thomas w jones i called him dr jones once and he said don't call me dr jones <laughs> i have to call him tom he's so nice and didn't you have one more a group on facebook Yes, I do. I suggest uh, to keep up with technology. There's a Facebook group called Technology for Genealogy. They have 9,000 members. That's the biggest group in genealogy that I know of anywhere. And that's how I can keep up with apps and what's trending and what people are thinking about Family Tree Maker's latest upgrade. So that's, that's a good place to go. All right, for our final question, it's called Tips from the Pros, and you are the pro. And I think what we'll do for this is if you could just provide three quick tips for somebody who's new to Google Plus or Google Hangouts on Air, what three tips would you tell them to help them get started? First of all, I'd like to see them connect with Cousin Russ. You can search for Cousin Russ or Dear Myrtle. Because Cousin Russ is online almost all the time and will hang out with you. And he will train you and help you if you're having trouble. The second thing I recommend if you want to learn about Google Plus is to look at my YouTube channel because there are some very specific short subject videos, we're moving more into short subjects, that explain Google Plus. And, and you mentioned you'd seen it. The third thing is to just use the search box at the top. You go to home and you click communities and then search for the word genealogy and see the plethora of genealogy groups. So if you have Acadian research, there's an Acadian genealogy group over there. It's called a community. On Facebook, they're groups. Over here on Google+, Plus, it's a community. And then hang out. Hang out for a while in that community, meaning read what's getting posted before you jump in so you know what the tone is. I think that was four things, wasn't it? Oh, well, it, it was perfect. It'll help, help everyone get started. <laughs> Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. Certainly. My parting piece of advice as genealogy professionals is to be you. Don't try to be Dear Myrtle. Don't try to be Mary and Pierre Louis. Figure out what is comfortable for you. That's your niche. So be you. And to get in contact with me, it's just Mert at DearMyrtle.com. I'm at dot .com. And from there, you'll find at DearMyrtle.com links to my blog, uh, links to the Google Plus community, et cetera. So it's good. Dear Myrtle, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Today's episode was a definite deviation from our normal routine at the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Dear Myrtle gave us an opportunity to take a broad look at the field of genealogy, taking us back to its early online roots and bringing us to the present, where there are amazing educational opportunities because of the advances in technology. She also stressed the importance of family. When thinking about your business, keep that in mind. Your family is why you do what you do. Never miss an opportunity to spend quality time with them. 
Dear Myrtle has been a pioneer in the field of genealogy, and today's discussion probably gave you lots of background information that you weren't aware of in regards to how genealogy has changed and grown. Take her encouragement and venture out and try some new things that you haven't tried before, such as Google Hangouts or Google Plus communities. Last week, I mentioned that I will be holding a workshop in January. It's called Setting Marketing and Business Goals for 2015. There are two dates for this workshop, Friday, January 23rd, and Saturday, January 24th. Both workshops start at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That works out best for nearly everyone in the world. The Europeans can participate, people on the East Coast of the United States and Canada can participate, and also um, the West Coast and Hawaii. The only people, unfortunately, that's not a good time for is uh, Australia, but we'll do something different for them. Interact with a great group of your peers and colleagues while you focus your goals for 2015. We'll be talking about setting goals for getting speaking engagements, getting writing assignments, gaining greater visibility to attract new clients, and many other topics. When we held this in January, there were participants from all different levels, from those just starting out in genealogy to very experienced genealogy professionals. You can read the comments to see what they thought of the workshop, but everyone got something out of the activities. Two things I forgot to mention last week. Space is limited. A maximum of 15 participants will be accepted for each day. So if you hold off till just a day or so before the workshop, you might not be able to get a spot. The other thing is that the workshop is not being recorded, so you will not have the opportunity to purchase a copy as a download. Because of the personal nature of the workshop, the interactions and the sharing of private information amongst the group, it really needs to be kept private. But because the group is interactive, you'll get so much more out of it. You can find more information by going to the website at thegenealogyprofessional.com. And now for this week's action item. Dear Myrtle is all about exploring technology and trying new things that will help us learn to do better genealogy and to find tools to help us do it easier. With that in mind, let's make it our goal to try something different this week. For those of you who've never tried Google Plus before, your task is to head over to Google Plus and set up an account. If you already have a Gmail account, then this will happen with the click of a button. If you don't have a Gmail account, then you will need to get one in order to have a Google Plus account. Once you're on Google+, then put Dear Myrtle and myself in a circle. In other words, follow us. And there are links in the show notes, so you don't even have to search for us. You can just click on the, the links. Then search for your genealogy friends and colleagues and add them to a circle as well. Next, head over to the Dear Myrtle community and see what that is all about. Then top it off by participating in a Hangout on Air, such as Mondays with Mart. Google Plus is a tremendous resource for genealogy professionals. You're missing out if you're not taking advantage of it. At least take the time to see what it's all about. Until next week, so long. <laughs>